My name is Lucid Kushev and I am the chairman of the computer science department at Boston University Metropolitan College and I would like to welcome you to the distinguished lecture series uh, talk tonight. Um, it's, we are having a very interesting subject uh, which is an introduction also to our new program in uh, multimedia, interactive multimedia and game uh, engineering. Uh, distinguished lecture series is a place where we invite uh, famous and uh, uh, important people from the industry and as well in academia to introduce us to the, the most interesting subject uh, where computer science is being uh, uh, implemented in real life problems. And um, to, tonight uh, we are going to uh, talk about uh, interactive multimedia, an area that is uh, um, rapidly expanding and um, I'd like to uh, invite uh, Professor Eric Brody to uh, who is going to coordinate our new program and who is the host uh, for our uh, speaker tonight to introduce the talk and to introduce the, our speaker. Thank you very much for your patience again. <clears throat> Uh, it's my pleasure this evening to introduce uh, our lecturer, our distinguished lecturer, Dr. Ian Lane Davis. He has a doctorate from Carnegie Mellon. He has numerous video game titles to his credit. He is the, the founder and CEO of Mad Doc Software. He was given this year's Entrepreneur of the Year Award by the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce. He's the editor in chief of the Journal of Game Development. And importantly for us, He's the principal architect of our new graduate certificate that Lou mentioned. And he's also, hopefully, if all goes according to the plan, the instructor or principal instructor in the fourth and final capstone course in the program. It begins in January, and if you forget any of that, just remember to email us at videogames at bu.edu. Before handing the podium to Ian, I should tell you that he received word just recently of a uh, a very good business opportunity for his company, and I think that anybody else, frankly, would have said, sorry guys, let's make this another time, but Ian worked his schedule around this. He's got to be gone at exactly 7.30, so I'm going to give maximum time Ian Davis. Uh, thank you for coming out on a... Uh Wednesday evening to see me talk. Um, normally I speak during the day, but uh, i am uh, been preparing, so I've you know, been practicing to talking a little bit, answering the phone in the evening, that sort of thing, working my way up. Um, the, uh, the topic I'm speaking about is a sort of subset of what I'm going to uh, work with Eric on for the AI class that we'll be having here at BU. Um, we're, I'm going to talk about characters in video games, and I'm going to show you a demo of something we put together that nobody has seen outside of two publishers. And it's, uh, it may be the last time I can show this demo for a while because uh, the uh, business opportunity, I'm, I'm flying to Paris to talk to one of the publishers about actually securing the rights for this game, at which point I won't be allowed to show it anymore until it actually comes out. So the demo is going to be the first time anyone outside of... Um, two different big publishers has had a chance to see it. Uh, I'm very glad to have the opportunity to, to speak here. Uh, Eric has been terrific and very enthusiastic about putting this program together here. Um, he's been working with me and a number of other people in the industry to put together a curriculum that will prepare people for working in the video game industry. And before I get to the specific of the talk, which is about characters in video games, um, I'll just give you a little background on the video game industry for those who aren't familiar with it except as something that you play every now and then with your friends in your dorm. Uh, the video game industry currently is a 30 to 40 billion dollar a year industry. It's one of the most cutting edge areas of computer science. It's where the most aggressive real-time graphics happen, uh, the most demanding networking problems happen. Uh, there is no place for doing artificial intelligence that's better than video games. Uh, my doctorate is in robotics. I was down at Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon. And the one thing about robotics is that uh, you go into it thinking, oh, this is going to be great because if my robot runs the risk of falling down the flight of stairs, I'm going to write really good code. And there were a lot of things that 
made you write good code for robots. So I did my research on an autonomous Humvee that would drive around off-road and I'd be riding in the back. And riding in the back of a Humvee that's using your code to steer itself is something that makes you really, you know, you check the end of every loop, you make sure there's no memory leaks. <laughs> but two things made me leave the physical robots behind. The first thing was uh, one day when I was, I was out testing, I, I had this great system, a neural network that did implicit sensor fusion of color video data and laser range data. It was cool. Um, and I'm testing at the test site by myself. I'm, I'm in the Humvee. And uh, you, you sit there that has the steering wheel. If you grab the steering wheel really hard, it will give you control back. But it's, it had a very powerful motor on the steering wheel, so it had a tendency to break your fingers. Um, and then if you hit the brakes, you know, you could also get control back. And I was doing a system that would just avoid grass, rocks, trees, that sort of thing. And it was driving me, you know, two miles straight off-road. It was great. But it wasn't directed towards any goal. And it decides to sort of wander off this back road at our test site, which I hadn't seen before. And this test site was a giant slag dump out in Pittsburgh. And slag is a byproduct of the steel mills. Um, there's this little access road, and I'm going around it. And I'd spent the last hour and a half training the vehicle to avoid obstacles. You know, I would, I would drive towards a tree, turn the learning on, and swerve away from the tree. And so it learned really well to avoid things that stuck up. On the right side, there was a cliff going up about 300 feet. On the left side, there was a cliff going down about 300 feet. <laughs> I had not trained it to avoid cliffs going down. And 300 feet below me was a highway, um, and I managed to slam on the brakes and stop with the left wheel of the government's Humvee cocked precariously over the edge of the cliff. It was raining, and the uh, mud looked like it was starting to slide, and I was given the choice of trying to extricate myself or call the lab and have somebody come and send help. And of course, I did what any grad student would do, and I just put it in reverse and got myself out of there. Good lesson, don't call your advisor and say, you know that $20 million robot we used to have? <laughs> the other thing was that uh, in the last 14 months I was in grad school, 12 of them I spent doing my research entirely in simulators because we weren't allowed to use the Humvee. Someone at uh, Martin Marietta in Denver had flipped their Humvee, which was under the same program, and the government put a, a moratorium on testing with them until they figured out what had happened and they concluded that they wrote bad code. Um, so we were then allowed to test it again, at which point someone sheared both the left wheels off of our Humvee. And uh, it's possible to actually shear both left wheels off of a Humvee, but you have to try really, really hard. <laughs> because I wrote all of my thesis work, most of it in the simulator, where I would then take it out on the vehicle, and, and it worked great. The, what worked in the simulator worked in the real world. I started thinking about video games, which is one of my passions, one of the things that I had originally thought about doing after grad school. And I was fortunate enough to have an offer to go out and work at Activision. Uh, I was there for four years and then started my own company. And one of the things that I focused on is artificial intelligence in games because of what it can do for the future of games. So I'm going to start my PowerPoint presentation now. If I can, uh... oh, that screen went entirely black. The control screen. Oh, there it is. All right. Nope, computer two. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Love technology. Um, so, every time I talk to my old advisors at Carnegie Mellon, um, besides them having a very wistful, jealous tone in their voice when they hear about the sort of things I'm doing, the fact that my company is much bigger than their lab, and... Uh, <laughs> I like that one too. It was great. There, at one point, there was that DARPA Grand Challenge, and uh, one of the people running the Carnegie Mellon team called me up and said, hey, do you mind in your spare time um, doing the AI code for the race? And I said, well, I've got 150 people here working for me right now and three different projects, and my spare time consists of about 37 seconds every third Thursday. And uh, we concluded together that wasn't enough time to do it. Um, but the other thing that we get into is the fact that the artificial intelligence that I'm able to do in games is usually much more interesting and much more compelling than what you can do with robotics. So the thing that you get in video games is you get to look at the high-level problems. When I was doing robotics, when I was working with the Humvee or, or other robots, you can't come up with a good path planning system if you can't sense what's in the room. So for me to walk from here to the other end of the stage with a robot, 
I need to have a vision system or maybe a sonar system, something that will detect these obstacles. And it's not enough just to have the sensor. You have to do the low-level perception. You have to have some sort of modeling. You never actually get to the high-level problems. And that's even assuming that path planning is a high-level problem. That's about the lowest-level problem you ever get to in games. The high-level problems of interactions with environment and humans and, and uh, human-like behavior are, are far above that. Another thing that you get with video games is you have an audience. So I have a recollection of being in grad school and working for a year or two on some research that resulted in a paper. I'd go to a conference. I would present the paper to 50 other people who were there presenting their own papers, 23 of whom were listening to it, um, 12 of whom were taking notes, two of whom remembered afterwards what went on, and maybe one of whom actually called me or sent me an email afterwards. And it's rewarding in its way, but when you make AI for a video game and you have two million Star Trek fans slagging you on a, on a bulletin board saying that it didn't act Klingon enough, then you have, you have a real litmus test. So there are expectations of behaviors. The hardest games to do AI for are actually sports games where you're trying to make a character that actually acts like Kobe Bryant, selfish, somewhat immature. Um, I hope he's not here. <laughs> the fact that you have an audience out there means you have a forcing function that makes you do good or makes you try to do good, and you definitely hear about it when you don't. Uh, so the things that are very different about it from usual AI research is that you've got a sense of narrative in most games. So it's not just a task to do, but there's a story going on. Characters have a background, they have personality. Um, but at the same time, you have shortcuts. So there have been plenty of cases in video games where there was an entirely pre-animated CGI sequence that made a reviewer of the video game say, what great AI, uh, when in fact it was just dialogue written by somebody. And the, the trick is to use that judiciously because your, your goal in doing AI for a video game is not to make great AI, it's to make a great video game. And you can use these tricks when you have to, but at the same time you want it to be seamless with the sort of AI that actually gives you replayability. When you think of the sort of genres of games that are very popular right now, one of the, maybe the only big PC game genre anymore is massively multiplayer online games, and those give you socialization and interaction with other people. Why is that something that's really popular? Well, you know, people like to talk to people. But the reason you have to do it in massively multiplayer games is because people haven't done the AI yet for social interaction with characters in a game that you play single player. At the same time, most people play games single player because it's hard to coordinate with other people. A video game is something you want to throw in when you're in your living room and you have 20 free minutes. And it takes more than 20 minutes to call somebody up and coordinate with them. Um, the other advantages are there are no cables that break, no wheels that pop off, and no power supplies that die, except on Xbox 360s, apparently. <laughs> yes. Of the people who laughed, I feel half of them actually had this happen. Um, love the Xbox 360, don't love their power supplies. Uh, so what goes into building a convincing character in a video game? There are a lot of things. There's the simple appearance. You need to have good animators. You need to have good modelers who put it together. Um, body language and facial expressions, these are all things that can be entirely scripted in certain sequences, but you want an AI that uses them in the right context. And now, I'm talking about AI for video games that really hasn't been done yet for the most part. There are some games like The Sims that have done some of this and have done a fantastic job. Uh, the Sims is much more of a sandbox game. When I play that, I always think, okay, now let's build a game on top of that. Um, and even though The Sims is one of the best-selling games of all time, it, it, it's almost not categorized in the same way as other video games. It's not a hardcore video game, but that system could be turned into something that then creates a lot of more interesting games on top of it. Um, you need the characters to have memories and awareness of the environment. So one of the most disappointing things whenever you have a role-playing game, these are the older term, the old old-time uh, role-playing games is when you go into a shop and you rob it blind and then you walk out and then you walk back in and the shopkeeper says, hi, how are you doing? How can I help you? It breaks the illusion somewhat. What's that? Yeah. So this, uh, I, I titled this White Hats and Pearl Handle Revolvers because there's a lot of 
there's a lot of appearance in AI in games. Like I said, you can fool people a lot of the time. Uh, you set up characters to to play on people's uh, predispositions. So, you know, I'll very quickly go through these, and and you guys can you know say whether or not it's a good guy or a bad guy. All right, Eric, good guy or bad guy? Good guy. Wow. Do you watch a lot of TV? No. <laughs> Besides the fact that this is Mark Valley, who is uh, almost always playing a good guy, he, he doesn't have a submachine gun or a rocket launcher. You know, the good guy is supposed to have pistols, and they're nice and shiny, and he's all chiseled and whatnot. Okay, all right, we'll give you this. All right, how about this one? <laughs> yes. So this, isn't, this is not uh, subtle, but most stuff in video games isn't at this point. Question? Good guy, bad guy? Ba good guy? Why good guy? Yeah, and the, the target. Somebody who's being targeted generally, you know. Uh, this is actually my wife also. She's in the front row, so she appreciates the good guy. Bad guy. I'll just drop that out there. Um, okay, this, you know... Could be friendly, nice older gentleman. Uh, add the cigar. Oh, smoking bad. Add the severed finger. <laughs> Much more bad. Um, robot that's half human has a giant claw. Generally bad. Robot that's nice and polished and uh, you know is carrying a nice reasonable weapon could be good. Could be bad. But the appearance is then has to be. It, accentuated with the body language. Uh, you know, I always uh, think of Marvin the Paranoid Android from the Hitchhiker's Guide series when I think about body language. Just the descriptions written of him, you know, limping along, oh, all the diodes on my left side are hurt. Um, body language is something that, except in scripted areas in games, is often overlooked. Uh, you, you can see some of it in games like Bully that Rockstar did. Uh, you can see some of it in The Sims. It's pretty compelling. You generally have a lot of custom animations, but in order to make it fit the situation, you need to blend the emotive animations with the situational animations. So if the character's walking across the room and it's depressed, you need to put the, the limping animation in there. Um, another thing that is very important in games and animation is uh, inverse kinematics work. And those of you who know robotics, kinematics is saying, here's joint angles, where's my hand? Inverse kinematics is, this is where I want the hand, what joint angles do I have to put it at? And when you create a video game, you'll find that one of the biggest costs these days is the art and the animation. And if you have to have animators figure out exactly where everything has to touch in a video game and make every possible animation, you will never ship your game. It will cost untold tens of millions of dollars. Uh, for reference, a typical video game these days costs between 10 and $30 million to develop, has a team of 30 to 100, 100 people working for two to five years on it. So they're, they're very big, expensive propositions. Something like inverse kinematics, if it's done right with proper constraints to make everything look human, will be a, a gigantic money saver. Um, another thing related to the body language is facial expressions. Right now you're starting to see people put together packages. There's one called face effects that can be integrated into the uh, Unreal Engine among others that lets you program different facial expressions in. Uh, we've used this, it's fairly straightforward. You still need to make the animators come up with the different expressions. They can be uh, morph targets, which is a series of basically different permutations of the polygons that get morphed between, or they can actually have jaw bones in them. Uh, different ways of doing it with different, different um, costs associated with it. But you also need, the, the interesting thing is that most people aren't using it with any sort of internal emotional model because there's really not that much in your typical video game other than, you know, I'm angry because I'm going to shoot you or I'm hurt because I just got shot. Um, one of the things that I'm going very quickly through these so I can get to the cool demo. <laughs> One of the things that is really important is making sure the characters move around the environment. So you're not going to ever get to an emotive place. You're not going to get to a position where the characters are compelling if they walk into things, if they can't get there. Uh, we recently had a problem with the game where guys were getting stuck, and that is a terrible thing. Um, but it's not just being able to walk around the world, which is a very hard problem to start with. 
people in the game industry have, have figured out, oh yes, you use A star search in order to find a path. But what they haven't determined is how you construct the different cells you're searching through. Uh, in a lot of video games now, in a lot of game engines, you just lay a bunch of waypoints and connect them manually, which is almost insane from a computer scientist's point of view. But that's the last thing that gets put into most game engines. Um, more than that, you need to, I, I put something here called dynamic battle choreography. You need to hint the environment. If you're going to have a character in a game actually in, look at an environment, evaluate it, and say, oh, that's a chair, that's a table, uh, that's a good place to hide, and then you're back to the whole robotics program. You might as well be doing this all with, with real robots. What you want to do is design the environment to let people know ahead of time. Maybe it's pre-processed, maybe the designers drop these hints down. It just depends on where you want to spend your money, on the designer time, which is generally fairly cheap, or on the programmer's time, which is more expensive but can get you more in the long run. One of the, I already talked about the memories. It's the, whether the player has visited a shopkeeper, who is attacking whom. Um, but more than that, when you start getting games like the you know the Rainbow Six games, one of the things that would have been more compelling to me was if the characters remembered how you were leading them. You know, if uh, Ding Chavez gets shot every time you send him to the front to open a door, he should react to that differently. Uh, you, you definitely lose that suspension of disbelief when somebody over and over again says, yes, boss, and runs up and gets shot right in the head. Um, I, I don't get that kind of blind you know, following of me at work. It's just not realistic. <laughs> or um, maybe I just suck leading people. Um, the, uh, this is what I was getting back to about the massively multiplayer games. Um, Running around and killing is uh, really a very small fraction of most human interaction. I'd say definitely less than 10% of what I do in a week. <laughs> and that's what most people do in games. Then you look at a game like World of Warcraft, which has come out and sold billions of copies and has you know, millions of people who play it all the time. They're not doing it to kill seven more tigers to get seven more pelts. They're doing it because they like talking to each other. They like the interaction. Um, you know, to me, the having worked on three Star Trek games, you, you start thinking in those terms sometimes, unfortunately. And the ultimate destination of video games is the holodeck. It's an environment you can go into, you interact with beings, you may not be clear whether they're human or AI at the time. And it's fun to have people talk back to you. Um, it's fun to have people comment on the battle. The, the, the Bill Paxton factors, I put it in there, from the movie Aliens, where, you know, after the battle, you know, he says, you know, in case you didn't notice, we just got our asses kicked back there. You know, characters that actually will reminisce with you about what, what you did. Um, but what we can do with AIs that you don't get in the massively multiplayer games, if we could make them react and talk back, is you can have them drive the story also. In a massively multiplayer game, it's a lot like playing a game of Dungeons and Dragons where you get together with your friends, there's a DM who's steering things, but if everybody says, oh, let's just go over here and do this, you know, the DM has to scramble to figure out what to do. If you have AI characters you can interact with and they can un unveil pieces of the story to you and steer you, that's, that's far more compelling. And what this gives us is genres and genres of games that you can't do right now. When you think of every other medium of entertainment, books, comic books, television, um, oral histories, movies, you, you have stories of romance, you have detective stories, you have all these things that you just do not find in video games right now. In most video games, if you're a detective, you're a detective who just happens to shoot absolutely everybody you see. And um, I don't know about real life, I've never been a detective, but I'm expecting that would not go over well. So, oh, okay, there we go. Um, let's quit out of this show you the wicked cool demo. Now, I, I, there's about a 43% chance that I have to run it twice to start it. Um, half the time, the speech recognition system doesn't actually recognize the microphone the first time I run it. So this is a game called Ruin. It's something, uh, it's a demo that we actually put together in three and a half weeks. So it's not, you know, the final polished art we'd want, although for three and a half weeks, it's 
really quite good. Um, but it's a game, uh, it's a role-playing game set in modern times. You are a kid who wakes up and uh, finds you have magic powers. And this version of the demo is the very dark rated M version of the demo where um, in the story, the kid's at a party, someone slips something into his drink, the substance is this magic substance that is being circulated. It's, it's a place into those CIA conspiracy theories of the CIA distributing drugs, but in this case they really are, and they're trying to find people with latent magic powers, and it all ties back into the Salem witch trials, and there's this really creepy story associated with it that uh, only if we have time will we get into, but I, I believe I've um, told it to any number of people, and I've preceded it by saying, this is really, really creepy, and afterwards they all said, that was really, really creepy. Um, it's not clear in some level that I am actually responsible for this game. It might be the ghost of someone named Samuel Wardwell who was hung as a witch uh, 300 years ago and happened to live exactly where the house I grew up in is. Um, so we'll get into that later if there's time <laughs> or if Samuel will let us. Um, all right. I'm going to say no. So this is also, again, this is the one that uh, hasn't been seen before, and um, so it should be interesting. Get my little cheat sheet. Designed for the Xbox 360. Takes a little while to load. I should have some sort of ruin sing-along song that we go into here at this point, but. The speech recognition in this is um, just off the shelf stuff right now. The recognizer is not a custom recognizer. It's not something that has uh, gone through a lot of tweaking, but it just kind of works. The ruin had worn off. Every muscle ached. Every noise crashed in my ears. Can we dim the other lights? Is there... I know Raph was feeling it too. Tina, I'm not sure she even shot up, but I wanted it. And Raph Do I have needed. control over that? And we were going to get some tonight, no matter who we had to take it from. Can you guys see that? Quite a view from up here. Now in order to um, get magic, you absorb special spell runes. Absorb. Let's see if this is on. This might be the alternate time. Absorb. Absorb. All right, this was in that 43%. All right, it will run next time. Hang on. It's much easier to explain that to a crowd like this than to the publisher. People don't mind rebooting their Xboxes. Every noise crashed in my ears. 
I know Raph was feeling it too. Tita, I'm not sure she even shot up, but I wanted it, and Raph needed it, and we were gonna get some tonight, no matter who we had to take it from. Let's get inside. We're too out in the open. Absorb. Abraza, shield me. We got company. Oso, fire shot all. So, this is not a non-violent game. Um, in this uh, particular scenario, you'll notice that uh, our characters are learning the magic powers. Uh, they are on a quest to get more of the ruin, which is the substance that gives them uh, extra powers. In the, over the course of the game, you realize that taking it destroys your body, and you need to actually find the people distributing it, destroy it, and stop it from being distributed. You also, in the course of the game, find um, someone who teaches you how to do magic the right way, which is this Samuel Wardwell character, who is a real person who lived. Um, but what the speech recognition gives you when you're just doing something as simple as casting spells, if you play most role-playing games, you'll find that you get one of two situations. The first situation is you need to pause the game to select a spell. The other situation is you can't pause the game to select a spell, so you choose the one spell that works most of the time and that's all you use. When you're casting magic spells in games, it's very hard to act like a real wizard because in every sort of story about magic, you, you make magic happen by saying magic words. That's how Gandalf did it. That's how Harry Potter did it. That's in the Arabian Nights. Everything from the beginning of time, every story about magic, you say magic words. And practically speaking, in playing a game, I remember we worked on the expansion pack for Dungeon Siege. There were 200 different spells you could cast, but most people only used one or two. It's the, the Diablo syndrome. You get the one or two you use most, you cast them. With this, I can have a, uh, a shield spell. Abraza, shield me. Oso, fire shot Tita. And I can use those all, it takes me exactly the same amount of time to use any of my spells. I also can use my voice, I chose the target using the voice. So suddenly, I don't have to scroll through targets, I don't need to put a crosshair over somebody, I can just use my voice and do it the natural way. I mute the microphone when I'm not, when I'm talking about the spells so that I don't actually cast them. <laughs> Let's move through here, quick life. Abraza, shield me. Abraza, shield me. Yo, this door is locked. Open. That's so much more satisfying. <laughs> Dark as shit in here. Lumen. I didn't have to go through any menus. I didn't have to scroll for anything. I just used the one... Uh, user interface device that I've been using since I was a year old, and uh, to, much to some people's dismay. Follow me. Okay. Are you okay? I'm pretty good. Fine, man. Target. Malafar. 
Malafar. Oso fire shot me. I'm a terrible shot. But when you're in god mode and you have a fire bullet, it doesn't really matter. Oh, I like this spell. This one's nasty. One of the things we're doing in the game is trying to <laughs> make the spells not be your traditional call lightning bolt from the sky. So we, we try to use like electrical outlets and stuff. Streaming issue, sorry. Caribbean shock. Oh, sorry. Target. Caribbean shock. Compelling as it is, it's still not the nastiest. Go there. I'll check it out. Follow me. Be right there. Notice nice normal police officers out there right now? Hang on a minute. Open. Avalam. Oh, sorry, wrong spell. <laughs> Target. Avalam. This is the nasty one. Summons a shade from the witch trials. Here's the best part. Those aren't, those aren't real cops, they're bad guys. All right, this is where it's rated M. Injecting oh. drugs into your arms is generally so frowned upon by the ESRB, which is the rating sport. Why were cops guarding this? Although Bioshock got away with it, so. Attack of the burn again. In our game world, there's this shadow world superimposed on this world, and it's where all the spirits of people who are murdered get trapped, and the world becomes warped and distorted around the areas where trauma has happened. Like, everywhere you go in the game. <laughs> Jesus. I, I can't tell this. This is that same area. See, I told you they weren't cops. Now, we do some contracting and consulting with Department of Homeland Security and some SWAT teams, and they actually think this is funny. <laughs> they think this is creepy. The fuck are those? Sorry, if there's any rules against using bad words, I'm sorry. <laughs> Target car. Malafar. Antoine, throw the car! I, I can't lift it. Absorb. Target car. Malafar. So in that good guy, bad guy thing, walking out of fire and talking in a really deep voice while your hands are burning, bad guy. 
So that's the end of the demo. And what we're starting to do with that game, obviously we're using the speech as a user interface device. Uh, you'll notice over the last few years, alternate user interface devices have become a, a big thing in the game industry. Um, uh, Harmonix had a giant hit, a local company with Guitar Hero and now Rock Band. And uh, they had interestingly previously done a game called Amplitude and Frequency, uh, two different games, that were terrific games but didn't sell a tenth as many units because you used something like this to play guitar. For most people out there, this is playing guitar. You look at the Wii, if you look at Wii Tennis, and if you had to use this to play Wii Tennis, there would be maybe three people who ever played it for more than two minutes. Um, and those would be the people who worked on it. And what we found is that, you know, this is playing tennis. This is not playing tennis. Tennis, not tennis. Tennis, not tennis. And uh, the more you can make your user interface map to what people expect in the fantasy, the better off you are. If you're going to be Harry Potter or Gandalf or some wizard, you really ought to be saying magic words to make them happen, to make spells happen. Um, the interactions with the characters, although it was fairly limited, in that case I asked them how they were doing, I told them to go there or to follow me, that sort of thing. Uh, you can also just say help and they'll come and heal you if you're hurt or fight somebody who's uh, attacking you. You can say charge, they'll run into battle. By making the user interface as natural as possible, you've suddenly opened up far more interesting and intricate games. And this starts to open up the different genres. I mean, we're, we're probably furthest away from making a romance game. You know, the uh, intricacies of human interaction on that level are something that um, you would have to have a video game designer understand to do it, and that just doesn't happen often. <laughs> uh, so... That's where we're furthest. That's the holy grail. But uh, you'll, yeah. <laughs> Look, I know game designers want this because if they can't get real dates. Um, <laughs> but anyway, that's that's the sort of stuff we're working on now. We're this is a game that, you know, if my trip to Paris goes well, could come out in two years. Um, if it doesn't go well, I'll give some more demos. Um, <laughs> but that's uh, that's where we're starting, and this is the sort of thing that uh, you know. Eric and Lou and I want to prepare students to work on, not last generation games where you run around and just shoot things. That's mildly interesting, um, but not terribly interesting. But this is a generation of games. Yes, we want to make great graphics. We want to make things photorealistic or, or super realistic or hyper realistic, whichever buzzword you want to go with. But we want to do more than that. I want to do more than that. I, I have no interest in making the, you know, 29th iteration of Doom, where you just run around and shoot things. I want to make games where you start to have those more human interactions. So that's the talk. I can take questions for the next 27 minutes. And if there's no questions, that's okay too. But yes. Oh, can I can I apologize ahead of uh, you know for the bad language in that demo? <laughs> I, I, I'm sure you never heard any of that before. <laughs> Yeah. What can, where can kids go of that age to study that kind of, uh, uh, the, maybe the, the level of math that, yep. that is involved, the graphics, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So if people didn't hear, the question is about where kids at, of high school age can go to learn skills that will be useful for them in making video games. Um, first, it, it's, it's worth noting that there's a number of different disciplines within video game development. There are graphic artists. Uh, and within that, there's subgroups, 3D modelers, 2D artists, uh, animators. There are, pardon me, um, computer programmers, uh, engineers. Some of them focus just on graphics, some on networking, some on artificial intelligence, some on gameplay. 
there's the somewhat elusive group called game designers. That consists of people who build levels, um, also people who will do scripting, but it can also be people who balance the game or even come up with the rules for a game. And it's a funny discipline because those things aren't necessarily related to each other, and everyone who makes levels wants to be the game designer, and it, you know the skill sets are, are not necessarily the same thing. So what are the skill sets? Oh, and then there's, of course, management, which is the most underrated aspect of it. You can have brilliant people, and if they're not working together and coordinated, uh, you'll never get a game done. Um, if you're inter I would say the more you learn about computers, the better. So study some computer science stuff, study some math. Uh, the relationship for me between math and computer science is the relationship between doing push-ups and playing basketball. So the one may not have any obvious end result for what you're going to be doing, but it increases your ability to do the other. Um, abstract math lets you start to envision systems that are complicated, that's, that are multidimensional. Um, studying multi-vector calculus is one of the best things for being able to do video game graphics and uh, just to be able to understand systems generally. Um, so I'd highly recommend those sorts of things. At the same time, if you're, if you're interested in designing video games, I'd still recommend you study the computer because the best artists understand their medium very well. But you also need to look into things like um, storytelling. So take English classes, study literature. You may or may not want to do creative writing. You may want to do literature uh, analysis. It's, it's funny, I, I took as many English classes in college as I did computer science classes. And in terms of getting my business going, the English classes were actually far more valuable than the computer science classes, besides the fact that unlike most video game programmers, I can write in complete sentences with punctuation. <laughs> and I don't need the spell checker most of the time. Um, that's not necessarily that important, because there are spell checkers, and there are other people who can interpret for you. Uh, but if you're in a situation where you need to coordinate a meeting, you need to convince people that your way is the way it's going to be done, you need to have the sort of discussion skills you would get in a small English class or any small liberal arts type of class where there's discussion and argument going on. Um, you'll, you could be the most brilliant designer, most brilliant programmer, most brilliant artist in the world, and if you can't stand up and present your case, nobody's going to listen to you because everybody involved in games thinks they know everything about it. And they don't. <laughs> but you need to be able to present your case. But definitely math, computer science, and some storytelling medium. Now, if you want to be a level designer, a game designer who tells stories more specifically, I'd recommend you take film classes. Because one of the most horrific things I ever heard when I was making a game was one of my programmers came up to me. He was designing the camera control system for our designers to use and doing the cinematics at the beginning of their levels for one of our Star Trek games. He said, I did this great system. I, I made it so that you can attach the camera to a spline and you can attach the target to a spline and you can attach the rotation of the camera to a spline and you can attach, you know, it, you, could, you could just make anything happen with the camera that you wanted by drawing dots and connecting them with splines in the world. Splines are curved lines going through these points. Um, I almost slapped him right there. <laughs> I said, there is a grammar for these things in Hollywood, in making movies and making televisions, and it does not involve arbitrary splines. You can get books that say, here are the five shots people actually use. Now, there's more than five, but there's five that get used a lot. There's even some shots that don't get used anymore. Like uh, when you look at movies from the 30s and 40s, there are these extreme close-ups when they want people to be very emotional, and you never, ever, 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 ever see that in movies anymore because it's incredibly cheesy. And <laughs> people have developed this this understanding of the presentation and the shots out there. So that's something I'd also recommend. That was a long answer. Yes? Um, what language do uh, your games use, uh, uh, the native language of your games? And a second question, as a manager now of a, of a successful company, how much time do you spend managing and how much time do you actually spend in game development? Well, uh, you know, we usually use English. Uh, no, sorry, kidding. <laughs> um, actually, I'll address that also. Uh, C++, 99.9% .9 of all game programming is done in C++. You'll find the rare case where somebody gets down 
to the uh, assembly level in games, but it doesn't happen often these days. Um, most, most code doesn't need to be optimized at that level, and the few things that do have already been optimized by the people making the graphics cards and the graphics libraries. Um, so C++ is for virtually everything. When you get to the, the level designers who are scripting missions, uh, they'll have any number of homemade scripting languages. Um, some people actually do use C for that. Uh, people have used things like Lua, other, other things like that. But the game code itself is all C++ for the most part. Um, the second question is, is just really the source of all the pain in my life. Uh, you know, when you get to have a company with 100 people, um, you need a lot of people around you helping manage it. And each team needs a lead. We actually had a very terrible experience growing the company uh, far too quickly at one point. And it was up around 150 people. And uh, the staff had grown and the management had not grown proportionately. And teams were, were utterly f um, flailing. There really was a point where I spent all my time talking to publishers, talking to lawyers, um, talking to my other managers. And there was, there was a good year where I spent almost no time designing games or writing code. And that combined being profoundly unpleasant with uh, leaving a void on the teams. And uh, the company suffered for that. Uh, so in terms of solution, it's have very good managers and don't grow too quickly, basically. Yes? Yeah. Uh, do you hear the comment on the game industry companies in the Boston area compared with the companies in Los Angeles area? For example, you work for Activision and uh, Microsoft also has a uh, game group. Do you care to com compare with their product companies? Yeah, well, there, there's. Boston's probably the fifth largest city for video game development in the U.S. Uh, Los Angeles, Seattle, San Francisco, and Austin are all all, all bigger. Um, there are a number of very big, well-established developers around Boston, Harmonix, Turbine, uh, Irrational, which is now 2K Boston, um, uh, Iron Lore, Blue Fang, uh, really good companies here. Um, in Los Angeles, you almost can't, you know, throw a fistful of sand from the beach without hitting a video game developer. But um, my experience is that it's easier to find good programmers in Massachusetts, good engineers, good software engineers. There are, in fact, more software engineers per capita in Massachusetts than any other state. There's more software engineers in California generally because it's a much bigger state. But we don't have trouble finding those sorts of employees. Uh, at the same time, the more that you need artists, the harder it is in this area. There are some good schools for it, and you can get good 3D modelers, but the real top-end animators tend to uh, be out in Los Angeles because that's where all the other animation happens for movies and um, commercials and such. So it's, it's very hard to staff that part of your company up with entirely local talent. I mean, you can get some young people, but the people with experience are generally on the West Coast for that. Uh, at the back. Um, I actually find that a lot of the rock star games fall into that category, and, and probably less the, the GTA games where a lot of your interaction is running people over, um, but more Bully. That was a game that had uh, characters woven. It had a, the sort of rock star trademark of an open world with stories woven in it, and there were a lot of characters that, that very much stood out. Uh, a lot of their memories were really scripted, so you know you were steered to have certain relationships, but there was a certain amount that you could influence that. Um, the initial plans for that game were even more ambitious, and that's the sort of game that in the future could have very compelling AI in it. So that one, that one's, that one at least is a light on the path, on the direction to go. Obviously, this entire industry wouldn't have been possible without uh, specialized graphics hardware. You could do this with just a bitmap and yeah. a bitblit. Uh, and there's been a lot of uh, talk or, or some movement in doing specialized hardware for physical modeling. Yeah. 
my question to you is, is there, do you foresee any specialized hardware for AI, or are the barriers to doing that for AI more complexity and good ideas and good programming? Yeah, uh, the question is whether hardware for AI will come about because there has been hardware for, for the graphics and hardware for the physics is starting up. People are starting to use that. Um, I know of companies that are trying to do that. I'm somewhat skeptical and not you know, putting my own money into those companies right now because the AI is very different from game to game. So yeah, yeah you could say, well, I can put an A-star search on hardware, which uh, one company has done, but it's not... The trick is not A-star search. The trick is decomposing your space properly. And that is not something that you can do universally on a piece of hardware at this point in time. Um, decomposing the space, you know, for, for those of you who are interested in path planning, if you want to do an A-star search to find a path, you need to break down the space generally into the largest possible convex regions you can. For some games, they just use a grid of equal size regions. Uh, for some they don't actually do the decomposition automatically. They just lay down points and connect them. Um, so the hardware, the, the parts of AI that are common are not the hard parts, and they're not the parts that are terribly expensive. You know, if, if you're using brute force to speed up your A-star search, it's because you didn't use the right algorithm to decompose the space to start with. Now, speech recognition is something that I could see that happening for. There are different techniques for that, but some of them are extremely well established at this point in time, and uh, speech recognition hardware is something that would do an awful lot to make the video game industry much, much more compelling. Um, in the state of game development today, what, what percentage of your coding is done from like, the ground up versus using existing engines versus developing your own engines? It depends uh, who you are. So, you know, I imagine every time Epic says, let's start something new, you know, they they have their old engines, but they can afford to start from scratch. You know, if you're 90% of most developers out there, you simply can't afford to do that. I would say most games in development now are licensing somebody else's engine. Uh, most of the shooter games use either the Unreal Engine or, um, well, most of them use that these days. There, there were other engines for that, but uh, most of them have fallen away. Um, Electronic Arts bought renderware, so nobody else can use that at this point in time. Uh, ID has a new engine out, but it hasn't caught on with people yet, um, although it's very, very cool. Uh, so most people are using some sort of engine for, for things like that. Other types of games, you know, real-time strategy games, people are using their own engines, but there's not that many franchises of that uh, anymore. Um, there are tools like Gamebryo that we've used on a number of games. Even when we're doing most of an engine from scratch, we, we might use something like that because it can talk to all the different video cards in a more efficient way. It's just, it's just not cost effective to solve the same problem over and over again. You know, in this sort of ideal utopian world, you could have just a game designer and say, okay, put this here and put that there and put that there and have everything come together. And um, that could happen in our lifetime, but not now but people are still using a lot of middleware. I, I don't know any game that doesn't at least use you know, uh, something called Bink for rendering movies or uh, somebody else's sound library. Yes? Say, say I'm a consign major, I'm a math and consign major, and I just got a call in a couple of years, not me, just like that. And uh, let's say your project in Paris takes off, so you need uh, 50 more people in your company. Uh, what do I have to do to become a game developer? What quality time do you need to become part of that pool of 50 people that you're looking for? All right, well, if I need to hire 50 more people, I authorize somebody to run me over with a car. Um, did that growth before, I don't want to do it anytime soon. But I, yes, that was not the, the point of the question is, if you're a computer science major, you haven't been working in games, computer science, math, how do you get into games? Um, there are a lot of junior programming spots open. You don't necessarily need to have done a game demo to get into video games, but you need to be a good programmer. Um, this is, <laughs> so this is addressed to the students out there who are, are still getting grades. Uh, when we look at programmers, one of the things I've learned, and this is a somewhat distressing thing, in many majors in college, your grade doesn't necessarily reflect how smart you are, and it, the same may be true in computer science. Your grade does not 
reflect how smart you are, but it really does reflect how willing you are to do the crap work that you have to do. So I knew a lot of brilliant programmers who in college <laughs> would not do certain projects because they didn't appeal to them. And um, they universally are terrible teammates to have on a game uh, because, you know, the, it's a lot like really liking steak and thinking being a butcher is fun. Uh, you know, really liking games and, and thinking working on them is fun is something of a mistake. Um, there are still a few game companies that have that, that wild attitude of not working very hard, showing up at noon, playing games all day. But those companies are either already really rich or doomed to be out of business in short order. And com the, the programming you need to do for video games is as high pressure, as intense as anything you'll have to do anywhere. So what we want to see from an applicant is that they'll do whatever's thrown to them. So the you know best people that I've hired have turned out to be the people who really did well in college because they were willing to do the things that weren't fun. And you're not going to have fun every day when you're making video games. It's just, it's not, you know, flying a jet plane is fun. Engineering it is not the same thing. So. The, yeah. Uh, they're used for some things in games. I mean, um, the problem is that you've got most of the video game market is on the consoles now instead of on the PC. So some PC games will use OpenGL, but if you're developing for the Xbox 360, you use DirectX. If you're developing for PlayStation 3, you use Sony's libraries. Um, so the console market is 80, 90% of the video game market at this point in time. I'm sorry, what? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it is and isn't a problem. Um, one of the things that we're fortunate in is that games is not the cutting edge of voice recognition at this point in time, although it really should be. Um, it's where speech recognition and more importantly, natural language processing is going to get its best workout. Uh, there are all sorts of people in uh, telephony and other arenas that have already done a lot of work on accent agnostic speech recognizers. Now, you still have to pay attention to languages. Um, one of, whenever you make a game, uh, you know, I joked earlier, we do our work in English. Well, we, we design our games actually with English writing in them, but it's a big process at the end of every game, towards the end, you localize it to 15 to 20 additional languages. And with speech recognition, you would need to do that same localization. One of the things that we are doing with this game, though, for the spells, most of them um, have made up words. So it's a special spell language. And there's, in most languages, between like 36 and 50 phonemes. Uh, we mapped out which ones are common to all of the languages you generally localize games to. And it turns out there's 18. And what we've done is made the spells entirely out of those phonemes. So the, the magic casting doesn't actually need to be localized. It's just the, the things where you're talking to your teammates. Did your program have to learn your particular uh, enunciation and pronunciation well, of it's, the spells? It's funny. Um, some recognizers do not need to be trained. Some do. The one that we have here, we're just using honestly, Microsoft's off-the-shelf, absolutely free speech API on this one until we determine what would be best for the target platform of the uh, 360 and the PlayStation 3. And uh, this is one that they do encourage you to train, but it turns out that someone at Microsoft Research sounds just like me, and I didn't actually need to train it. Uh, I don't know why that happened, but it did. I think the question next. a lot of students uh, would have is stability, of this field, job growth? Uh, do you think, what's the future like uh, for students planning to take a concentration in game engineering at BU? Just just a second certificate, you know, as part of their regular master's or CIS? Yeah, I, I think that uh, in terms of, this is a question about stability of 
this industry and future employment. Um, outsourcing, for example, was a big uh, yeah. buzz, buzz item well, it's interesting. Outsourcing in the video game industry has been limited largely to art uh, because you can give a list of objects to be made and outsource it, and we've done some of that. Um, most people are somewhat disappointed with the results they get because you need to go over them, ver make sure that everything is meets the standards you have. Uh, you need to make sure that you can... Um, have the people who are doing the work overseas actually see it in the context of the game. Our worst cases with outsourcing were where they would make it, but they wouldn't have the game engine because we weren't allowed to give them the game engine to use, and it just didn't look right when it got put into the game engine through nobody's fault. In terms of computer programming, I think it's, it's far more stable to start with. Um, I was talking to a number of different publishers, and they've, they've, you know, they had opened development houses in other countries and they said, you know, even though the people there are cheaper, they're getting more expensive and the productivity does not match what they get out of their uh, North American development houses. So the productivity here is still very high and um, in terms of the industry, it's, it's growing so quickly that there will always be jobs for people. Our, our problem isn't there's too many people applying for jobs, generally. It's there's, there's too few and the game industry is going to continue to grow at a fairly enormous rate. It's not, uh, it's not something that gets affected by recessions, bad times. In fact, it goes up when people have more free time on their hands. <laughs> Are we out of time? Vicky tells you you've got to stop. Oh, my wife tells me I have to stop. <laughs>